Since Sid Barrett's departure from Pink Floyd was its own video, I think it's best to do the same with Roger Waters leaving the band. While the story of Sid's breakdown almost comes off like a Greek tragedy of a crazy diamond caught in the crossfire of childhood and stardom, this is mostly a story of egos and lawsuits. It's a battle of words that's still going on to this day between Roger Waters and David Gilmour. This is a very touchy subject. It's pretty much the point where Floyd fans split into two different camps. You're either Team Roger or you're Team David. If I'm being honest, I tend to drift more into the David camp, I'm a guitar player, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to try to be as objective as possible and relay all the facts the best I can, though it's going to be hard because there's a lot of contradictions of exactly what went down. On the lighter side, it does give us a chance to focus on their solo albums from the time. Let's backtrack to 1984. With the final cut being their least successful album in over a decade, and no plans to tour, Pink Floyd's future was uncertain. Feeling creatively inhibited on the final cut, David Gilmour released his second solo album, About Face, co-produced by The Walls producer, Bob Ezrin. I need another outlet for myself. To, to be able to go out and work and make music. About Face sounds more contemporary for the times, and he made a very 80s MTV video for Blue Light. Though the song Murder was a reaction to John Lennon's assassination and a highlight. Then you brought it down in me, another man's name. You Know I'm Right, not to be confused with the Nirvana song, is at least partially about his arguments with Roger. Ultimately, I don't find About Face quite as good as David's first solo album, but it does have its moments, including a climactic guitar solo near the end of a song called... Near the End. David also toured and significantly toned down the spectacle of the previous Floyd tours, focusing on the musical side of things. Despite inconsistent ticket sales, Dave was able to hone his presence as a frontman. Nick Mason joined Dave for the Hammersmith Odeon show, where they performed Comfortably Numb, and even Roy Harper sang Short and Sweet with him. Dave would also work with a lot of other artists. He would produce Dream Academy's record, which featured future Floyd bassist Guy Pratt. He worked with Brian Ferry, who also worked with Guy Pratt. Man, did Guy just play with everybody? And Kate Bush, where they performed that Stranger Things song you're all sick of by now. Shortly after About Face, Roger Waters would finally release his debut solo album, The Pros and Cons of Hitchhiking, the same project he had presented along with The Wall half a decade earlier. It's actually set in real time, and the theme is mostly centered around the protagonist's relationship with his wife. Not quite the Douglas Adams adventure as the title might suggest. The pros and cons of living with one woman within the framework of a family against uh, the call of the wild. It's an interesting idea for an album, but I don't consider the pros and cons of hitchhiking all that memorable musically or even lyrically. I feel even the final cut had more weight to the lyrics. In fact, there's a song called Go Fishing, which seems to lift the melody straight out of some songs from the final cut. It does have some nice guitar work with Eric Clapton sitting in on the sessions. He really gets to stretch out on the song Sexual Revolution, maybe the best song on the album. It's kind of weird that Eric played so much more on the solo record than David did on the previous Floyd album. He would also join Roger on the tour, along with future Floyd guitarist Tim Renwick. Unlike David's tour, Roger utilized similar theatrical elements to the wall. Consequently, the show was very costly to put on, and some shows suffered from low ticket sales. I suddenly the realization has come home to me that nobody made any of any connections between me and those old Pink Floyd shows. Otherwise, they'd be buying tickets for this. Nick Mason says he saw Roger's show at Earl's Court and felt weird seeing Pink Floyd's material being played without him on drums. I mentioned before, Nick had released an album in 1981 with Carla Blay and Robert Wyatt. He mostly busied himself with motor racing and collecting cars, though did cut an album with Rick Fenn of 10CC called Profiles. David Gilmour actually provided lead vocals on the song Lie for a Lie. It's kind of a generic 80s album, though I believe it was meant to score a short film Nick had been working on about motor racing, and he and Rick Fenn would continue to score films throughout the 80s. 
And what about Rick Wright, their estranged keyboardist? Well, he formed a duo with new romantic D. Harris called Z with the 1984 album Identity, drenched with Fairlight synthesizers. You think Rick being a synth pioneer would really find his feet in the new wave era, but Rick himself would call this project a disaster, and yeah, I, I had a hard time sitting through this album. As for Sid Barrett, he apparently moved back to Cambridge after having lost all his money. No new music, no new anything. Apparently Pink Floyd was invited to reform for Live Aid 1985, organized by The Wall's star, Bob Geldof, but they declined. Roger offered to perform with his band, but only David performed on stage with Brian Ferry, along with future Floyd keyboardist John Karen. I combed through a lot of interviews around this time and found that David seemed somewhat open to doing another Pink Floyd album with Roger. If we do another album again, it will not be done like the Final Cut album was done. We'll have to achieve a better compromise situation between us. But Roger seemed much more dismissive. I don't see any future for the band. Why? Because we don't want to work together anymore. Do you want to elaborate on that at all? Not really, really? No. Okay. This is where Roger starts to insist that he alone is Pink Floyd. On the final cut, he's the sole writer, he had become the lead singer. It's not an exaggeration to say the other guys had become glorified session musicians, except they could still challenge Roger's creative ideas. If you watch the EPK for the pros and cons of hitchhiking, he definitely infers that. My pros and cons show will be, is, is a Floyd show. Except Eric Clapton's playing the guitar and Andy Newmark's playing the drums, instead of Dave Gilmore and Nick Mason. But everything else is the same. It seems Roger viewed Pink Floyd as something that needed to end so that he could further his solo career, much in the way the Beatles had solo careers after they formally dissolved their partnership. Apparently they had dinner with manager Steve O'Rourke, and Dave and Nick left thinking Pink Floyd would continue after Roger's tour. Roger left thinking they all agreed to break up the band. At this point, they should have just done a cover of Led Zeppelin's communication breakdown. According to Nick Mason's book, the final straw occurred when Roger told Steve O'Rourke that he wanted to renegotiate his contract with Pink Floyd in secret. Steve felt obligated to disclose this request to Dave and Nick. Well, Roger considered this a betrayal and wanted Steve gone. David and Nick said no. In 1985, Roger wrote to the record company saying that he was leaving the band. The band is over. That's the end of it. The work is there. It stands. It's, it'll be there. You know, it's recorded online. It's not the legend. It's not that important. In fact, it's important that it be destroyed. According to Roger, the actual reason was to avoid any legal issues that arose from Pink Floyd not delivering another album, and after all, there was no way they could make a Pink Floyd album without Roger Waters. Well, here we are. I mean, this one still boggles my mind. Like, no one on Roger's legal team advised him that this is a really bad idea. I mean, Dave had already released two solo albums with notable reception. Roger must have known that he was clearly capable of producing something without him. Regardless, Dave essentially said, all right, you can leave the band if you want. We'll just cut an album without you. And Roger said, you'll never do it. And well, I guess that gave him even more of an incentive to move forward. So, I mean, I have spent 20 years of my life um, working on building that name up. Even I see no reason whatsoever why I should give that up just because one guy says he doesn't want to do it anymore. I mean, if someone leaves a group or something, that they, the others normally get to carry on. David and Nick were now officially Pink Floyd and they were planning to invite Rick back. I bumped into Rick in Greece on holiday that summer and uh, talked to him about the possibility of carrying on. Although there was a clause from his agreement to leave the band that prevented him from rejoining as a full member, so he would once again be a salaried musician. And I'm sure Roger was very diplomatic and supportive of his bandmates' new musical direction. I'm lying, he sued them. One of the most famous lawsuits in rock history. In 1986, Roger Waters went to high court to bar his bandmates from using the name Pink Floyd and called it a spent force creatively. The argument was me rather pompously, and, and I free admit now erroneously, suggesting that because I wasn't in the band anymore, that the brand and band name should be retired. There was a lot of mudslinging in the press. It's very difficult to remain on good terms when someone's trying to completely fuck you up, you know. 
Honestly, this is where a lot of the contradictions in interviews come from. Like, there's this long-standing claim that the record company rejected Pink Floyd's initial cut of A Momentary Lapse of Reason, which Floyd fans now regard as fact. And looking up the source of this information, which sadly a lot of Floyd fans don't, I found out that this came directly from Roger, which Dave has retorted as a tissue of lies. Of course, I'm not sure how a tissue can hold lies. And for years, Roger would continue to claim that he was Pink Floyd, like saying he gifted the other's writing credits on Dark Side of the Moon. Look, here's the thing. I acknowledge that Roger's contribution to Pink Floyd is enormous, especially his lyrics, and none of the other band members have ever negated that. But as somebody who has made records, I can tell you it is still a collaborative process. Even Prince had the revolution to bounce ideas off of. You can't relegate Dave's contributions as a bunch of rock and roll guitar solos. He's adding inflections to the melody. Rick is dressing the songs up with these sublime chord sequences. Even Nick is very involved in the production process of Dark Side of the Moon. Lyric writing is not the end-all determination of songwriting. Elton John never wrote a lyric in his life. Should we rename his entire catalog Bernie Taupin Records? But then you listen to the pros and cons of hitchhiking, done without Pink Floyd, and like I said, it's just not that memorable. It's not bad, it's just clearly missing something. It would be a collaboration with Jeff Beck that would produce Roger's best album, but we'll get to that when we get to it. So long story short, there wasn't much of a case to be had for Roger claiming sole ownership of the band. There was no formal declaration of who the band must consist of, and in the public mind's eye, the members of Pink Floyd were kind of anonymous. Yeah, in retrospect, we all know who they are, but at the time, there was no internet to look these things up. Most of their album covers never featured pictures of the band. They didn't appear on MTV. Their faces weren't on the cover of Rolling Stone. They didn't even appear on screen for the wall film. The last time anybody had seen live footage of them was live at Pompeii. That was 1972. Roger Waters and David Gilmour just weren't John Lennon and Paul McCartney. In fact, the member who had the most recognition was Dave because he had been playing with other artists. And more importantly, Pink Floyd had already gone through this with Sid Barrett. I feel David Gilmour summed it up with this. Sid Barrett's Pink Floyd had been one Pink Floyd, and the, the Pink Floyd with the four of us, Roger, Rick, Nick and I, had, had been another one. And this would be another, another version. Well, he's right. And I know a lot of fans will argue, oh, it's different, Sid was only there for one album, Roger was there from the beginning. Well, so was Rick, but Roger still made the final cut without him. Peter Green left Fleetwood Mac, Denny Lane left the Moody Blues, Peter Gabriel left Genesis, Brian Jones died, but the Rolling Stones kept going. Same with Dwayne Allman and the Allman Brothers, who had a lot of personnel changes over the years. It's not like there's no precedent for this. At the end of 1987, while Pink Floyd was already on tour, the lawyers eventually settled out of court on David's houseboat. Roger would retain the creative rights to the wall, along with the flying pig from the Animals tour. Wait till you hear how they got around that. And Roger would never appear on a future Pink Floyd album again. A couple months before the new Pink Floyd album, Roger released his second solo album in July 1987, Radio Chaos not to be confused with the evil organization from Get Smart. Oh, I never really sat down and listened to this album in full, and when I finally did, well, let's just say it was very 80s. Though that is kind of the point of the album. Something of a conversation between this disabled genius using radio waves to contact a DJ played by Jim Ladd. Roger's gone on record saying he felt pressure to make something more commercial and wishes he had never made this album. Though honestly, I don't think it's that bad. I think it is a step up from pros and cons of hitchhiking. Some songs like Powers That Be did stand out to me. And I feel like the imminent threat of nuclear holocaust on four minutes leaves you with a much bigger impact than Two Sons does on the final cut. But Roger's tour didn't fare any better as he found himself in competition with Pink Floyd. I remember one particular night I'm playing in Cincinnati to about 2,000 people in a 6,000 seat you know, arena and they're playing the next day to 60,000 people in the football stadium next door. 
playing all my songs. And unfortunately, the extravagant theatrics of the show went heavily into debt, and Roger would not tour again for over a decade. So with all that said, we've now set the stage to discuss a momentary lapse of reason. But the last thing I want to say is, I don't want it to seem like I'm making Roger the villain of the story. Even he himself has said he regrets suing Pink Floyd over the name. And I was wrong. Were you? Of course I was. Who cares? Being in a band is hard, especially being in Pink Floyd. It's just the way things worked out and how the story continues. And to those skeptical about listening to an album without Roger, look, I, I get it. If you love The Wall or you even love the final cut, it's got to be really hard to listen to a Pink Floyd album without Roger Waters. Dwayne Allman is one of my favorite guitar players of all time, and it's really hard to listen to anything Allman Brothers related without him. But I can still acknowledge they carried on and made some great songs, especially with Warren Haynes and Derek Trucks bringing new life into the band. I say keep an open mind. If these albums don't do it for you, that's okay. Even I have issues with the next album. But from here on out, let's leave the arguments aside and focus on what's important. The music. I know how disheartening it is to see our beloved band members arguing like this, and emotions can run high. I came of age as a musician, writer, producer, and just general music lover from Pink Floyd, David Gilmour, Roger Waters, Richard Wright, Nick Mason, and even Sid Barrett. So did a lot of people. So many of us, our lives have been changed by their music. So when we see David Gilmour and Roger Waters fighting, it's like watching your parents fight. It hurts. It doesn't matter if David Gilmore's in the right or Roger Waters is in the right. or the, It doesn't matter. It still hurts. I just wish there could at least still be some reconciliation between these two guys, but it might not ever happen. But here's the thing. We are the ones that are going to carry on the legacy of this music. You and I, the millennials, the Gen Zers, we are going to keep playing these records and buying these records and carrying on their legacy. You know, so honestly, it's the music that's important. This music has given so much joy, so much solace, so much peace of mind to so many people, myself included. When I listen to this music, I feel like I'm with my father again. I feel light in the darkness, that spiritual upliftment that you can only get from listening to certain kinds of music. And I know I'm kind of spoiling my thoughts on this, but one of those albums is The Division Bell. And for you, maybe it's The Final Cut. And if it is, you go right on loving The Final Cut. There's nothing wrong with that. Let's not bitch about it, okay? We don't need to say no Roger, no Floyd, or oh, Pink Floyd was better off without Roger Waters. We don't need any of that, okay? I just want to finish talking about these fantastic albums and move on. Move on with our lives. There's so many terrible things going on in the world. We don't need to waste our energy on any of this. Anyway, uh, join me next time as we talk about a momentary lapse of reason. Thank you.